Thank you very much for tuning in to yet another episode of Bible Answers. We have invited Umfuns Mapumulo. He has brought another character in his bag to teach us a few things about how we can tackle our own lives. Jab Mapumulo is one of the pastors who has afforded us the benefit of his time, his insights, and his theology. And we're ever so grateful to him and Umem for allowing us to tap into his wisdom. Mpundis, welcome back and thank you very much for agreeing to talk to us. Thank you very much. So now, you want us to talk about Jonah. A character that is both famous and infamous. (laughs) 
One, because he said Andes. <laughs> <laughs> And Strange. secondly, because he was very angry. He had a word, he had a stiff word with God yeah. because of God's decisions. But first, let me give you the chance to introduce us to Jonah. Yes. Who is Jonah and where do we find the story of Jonah? Yes, we, we found the story of Jonah in the book of Jonah <laughs> in the Old Testament. Jonah is a, uh, is a minor prophet and... Uh, it's a very interesting story because partly, partly because we can identify with it, but I think the major thing is that uh, this the story or the book of Jonah it's a book about mission. It's a book about the reason why we exist as a church, you know, and and for me that that is the the, the critical part. The book of Jonah is the book that actually established uh, this, this practice of uh, mission to different cultures, to foreign lands, and, and probably also, not even probably, and definitely points out the importance of attitude in mission. You know, and I will talk more about that as we go. All right, give us an overview of the story of Jonah, and then after that, I'll, I'll, I'll nitpick on a few parts that I found rather interesting in the story. Just the overview yes. of the story. Mm-hmm. Jo- Jonah is, uh, is, 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 was born in um, a town of Zebulun, and that is not far from uh, Nazareth. So that means Jonah was a, uh, a, a Galilean prophet just like you know, so he was a homeboy of Jesus. Yeah, we can put it that way. Even though, you know, the, the, the time period between Jonah and Jesus is about 750 years. So that's where, that's where he comes from. And, uh, and there is also an underlying factor in the story of Jonah that shows itself up when, as you see him interacts with God. For example, in, the, in that area, part of the world, they believed that uh, God is geographical. So, so God, God works, as an example, uh, in Gauteng, is not in, in Eastern Cape. There's a different God there, you know. So the one who works here is, is, is local. So that is why, therefore... <laughs> uh, Even Jonah believed this. Exactly, because Jonah ran away from the Lord. At least that's what he thought. Yeah. So, so, so something had to happen for Jonah to really begin to understand that uh, that traditional, that tradition, a uh, traditional belief is real, was really not correct. Now, a, and this is another aspect also in the story of Jonah that is important, and that is uh, tradition is good as long as it supports uh, thus saith the Lord. Now, there's the problem with tradition is that uh, even when it is proven that uh, it does not hold water, but you, you can't find a way to, you, you don't reverse tradition. Tradition remains tradition, no matter what. So, so you see, and when you look at the story of Jonah, therefore, that uh, even Jonah, even though Jonah was a a God's prophet. But Jonah was still affected by the culture of the day. And so some of the things that he did or said were affected by culture because, I mean, the fact that uh, Jonah had a problem to go to Nineveh because they just, in in their Jewish Hebrew uh, uh, culture, there was just no room for such people in the kingdom. So it, it, it was just, very unwise for God to send Jonah to that place. It's like, maybe God does not know Nineveh. Why, why did God want to save the people of Nineveh? Was there a good person there? We know God sent angels to speak to Lot, and Abraham interceded for the people at the time. And there was a tete-a-tete between God and Abraham. What if there's 50? What if there's... 30, 20, and so forth. Was that the case? Was there, were there good people in Nineveh such that God 
would have a deliberate intention to save them, thus sending a prophet. None of us is good, but by God's grace. But, but here's my point. I think God was dealing more about uh, Jonah and his mindset than he was dealing with Nineveh. Because as long as Jonah and his contemporaries thought that uh, there was no room for the, in the kingdom for such people, then they, there was no room actually for them in the kingdom. So, so, so I think the, the, the primary uh, uh, message or mission here was them more than the people of Nineveh. God calls a Jonah. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, is it not possible that perhaps even those who are called, like yourselves, pastors, prophets, bishops, all the titles, these holy titles, it's possible that God can call you and still you don't know that God operates everywhere. He's omnipresent. You made a very interesting observation there that Jonah left his own home country, thinking he's running away from an omnipresent God, a God who is present everywhere. Mm. Is it possible, that, therefore, to glean? Would I be correct to say you can be called by God, but still not know the God who has called you? Very good question. Yes. Uh, God does not call us simply because we fully understand him or we have matured enough, or we, you know, no, it's not the case. We learn of God day by day. Uh, God did not call me because I fully knew him. Uh, and, and therefore, and you see this, I think the disciples are a classic example in this case. Uh, because whilst they were with Jesus, they were still had issues uh, about uh, uh, in the new government, what position will I hold and you hold? And, and, and this is why you begin to say, man, these guys did not get it. Did not get it. So, so, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a good example for us today to say, never assume, and I'm saying specifically now, for people in the church, never assume that... Um, because you've been in the church for X number of years, therefore you, you, you know and understand who God is and how God works. And I mean, I've, I've even had people, you know, uh, when I first came to this church, I used to hear people, I was young then, say, you know, I was, I was born in this church. You know, I used to think there was a maternity ward in the Adventist church, you know, because people prided themselves about, about being born in the church. And that has nothing to do with their salvation, you understand? So, so, and this is where you begin to say that there is danger in us in the church more than those that are outside because we, we may find ourselves tempted to think that we have arrived and yet we are still far off. Oh, yeah, man. Okay. And then Jonah decides uneasy. Yes. God says, go to Nineveh. He decides and easy, yes. I'm going to Tashish. Correct. What is the definition of sin from this? Isn't the, defini the definition of sin betraying or denying or ignoring a direct instruction and doing your own thing? Would that not be a fitting application here that when Jonah said, I'm not going there, and easy, yes. he was sinning? Sin is when you know good and choose to do bad. Just like Jonah. Th exactly. So Jonah sinned. Yes, he definitely did. And again, that's why I was saying in, uh, earlier on that uh, uh, now you've got to look at the, at, at the you know, uh, where there is content, there is context. Now the context of Andizi is culture. That's the context. Because, God, because, because well, the Jews, remember when Jesus came, for example, they said, we be the son of Abraham. And here's the implication. We, we don't need you for salvation. We qualify by virtue of our pedigree. Yeah. You know? yeah. so, so that's the same story with, with Jonah. Jo Jonah. Jonah realized that this God who operates here in Zebulon 
uh, his local God, because that's what the local understanding is. So if I leave him, the other one in Tashish is a wiser God. He will understand yeah. that. <laughs> you see, that's why that's why he could he could do that. But 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 Jonah missed the point that uh, that God is omnipresent. That's the part that he missed. And, and of course, the fact that uh, 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 God loved the whole world, not the Jews, the whole world, that he, he died for all of us. And he missed that. And, and that's why they had a struggle to deal with those that are non-Jews. And that is why I'm saying the book of Job is a book about mission. You know, And when you understand and the attitudes that are involved in being a missionary, then it changes the whole picture. And then we are seeing a Jonah now who has decided he's going to Tarshish, yeah? Mm. Gets onto the ship, and the reason for him to do what he's doing, every time it, it, it plays in my mind, it's like people, South Africans, who went to exile, so to speak, because they just could not live with these oppressive white people. And now God says, go and minister. God, I, I'm going to punish the apartheid government unless you go and preach to them and they repent. Then I will not punish them. I'm trying to apply this in our context. Would it be wrong for a South African who has suffered oppression under an apartheid government to say, I am not going to preach to these people. These people burnt my father while I was watching. These people raped my mother while I was watching. These people have taken my sister slave, slave as a sex slave there. I am not going to preach to let God punish the apartheid government. Remember Archbishop Desmond Dudu. We prayed for the upper, against the apartheid government. We just might pray against you. <laughs> so my question is, um, is it wrong really? Was it wrong? We, we say he sinned, but was it wrong for Jonah to say I am not? Because the people of Nineveh were an, an oppressive people. They were, an op they were a brutal... Idolatrous people. Exactly. They were mm. evil people. Mm. They were not just neighbors. They were the neighbors that would come and steal your wife and watch, you would watch while they rape your wife. They were evil people. So was, was, was Jonah really wrong to say, and easy? Jonah is sent to Nineveh. He chooses Tashish. And, uh, and, and he gets in the boat. He finds himself in the belly of the fish. And uh, he changes his mind there. He prays and God forgives him. And uh, then he, he, he makes the right decision. Now, God found a reason to give Jonah a second chance by forgiving him for the wrong that he had done to want to go to Tarshish instead of Nineveh. What am I saying? That forgiveness is not an option for Christians, for humanity. That uh, as much as Jonah thought that uh, those people were bad, they were just as bad. It's just that uh, their bad is, is different than our bad. And that is why it is true that um, there is the worst in the best of us. And, uh, and, and there, there is also... Uh, best in the West of us. That therefore it behooves none of us to criticize the rest of us. So, 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 so therefore, Jonah could see idolatrous practices. Jonah could see cruelty. Yeah. God, Jonah could see all of these things, but Jonah could not see his own wrongs uh, 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 towards God and towards those very people. Yeah. Because if you are as godly as you as you think you are. Yeah. yeah. You should have been the one ready to say, Lord, I'm ready to go and assist those people. Yeah. I know that as cruel as they are, when I get to there, you will protect me. Yeah. You will help me to be uh, successful in, in helping them. Okay, okay. And then comes this part now that sounds ridiculous. It sounds really like a fairy tale. Yeah. Like these cartoons that children watch on television. Yes. A fish? <laughs> really now? Can we really say to the person who has never read the Bible that there is a human being who was transported, luxury line, fish, really, Mfundis, 
What exactly? Did the fish incident, Jonah being swallowed by a fish and Jonah talking to God and praying and kneeling and all of that inside the belly of a fish. What fish is this first? Or is it a whale? What, what fish is And is there room inside a whale? Really, scientifically speaking, really, Mpundis, what exactly is the teaching in the story of Jonah being swallowed by a fish? You know, there was an argument uh, between two people about the fish and the swallowing. So this guy says, do you really, like you're asking, do you really think this thing happened? You know, uh, I mean, that's ridiculous. And, 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 uh, and the guy says, look, when I get to heaven, I will confirm. I believe it now, but I will ask, as you are asking, uh, definitely uh, about the story, the truthfulness of the story. And, uh, and this guy, the guy says, okay, what if you, the story is not true? And, and this one responds and he says, well, he talk about now the conversion of, jo- of Jonah. He says, well, you will then ask where you are going. <laughs> so, so look, uh, the Bible says the fish swallowed Jonah, was in the belly of the fish for three days. And if the Bible says it, I believe it. Now, we can argue about the type of fish, the size, uh, that's neither here nor there, you know. Uh, now, scientists will would make different submissions about the size of the fish. Some will say, well, this must have been a whale. Uh, this must have been something uh, bigger than a whale. Uh, but those fishes are extinct now, and so on, all these submissions. And for me, that, that is neither here nor there. Uh, I, I believe when the Bible says he was in the in the belly of the fish uh, for three days. But, but why, why, why is this important? What, what can we learn from this? Uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, when, when I talk to couples, I always say sometimes, you know what? Sometimes even when you are in doubt about what your man tells you, just try to believe. Can you imagine when Jonah came home and said to his wife, when the wife asked him, where were you, where were you for the last three days? Yeah. And Jonah says, I was in the belly of the yeah. fish. Yeah. Where, where will you find that woman who will believe that? Exactly. There is just no way. Yeah, but I'm clever, ne? You are telling me that you were in the belly of fish? Yeah. Do you think I'm foolish yeah, exactly. now, eh? <laughs> Exactly. This is where now, this is where now faith comes in. Okay. Yeah. Because this is where faith comes in. I don't see it, but I believe it because God says it. Yeah, you're being pastoral now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then and then he arrives in Tarshish and he he he, he in, in Nineveh rather, sorry, yes. and he preaches, yes. preaches, preaches, preaches a false sermon. He prophesies a lie. He says God is going to destroy you yes. in this number of days. Mm. And as we know now, God never destroyed mm. Nineveh. Was Jonah a false prophet? He preached a lie. He preached that God is going to destroy Nineveh. Repent or else. And then God did not destroy them. Was Jonah, and this question was asked on my radio show, and I found it rather, well, peculiar. I have my own answers to it, but I'd like to hear a pastor's answer. Jonah is the only person I know of who accused God for being uh, compassionate, uh, for being loving, uh, for not delivering on his promises. Uh, You say you're going to destroy and you don't destroy and so on and so on. Jonah was not ready to be saved. Whilst God was trying, was using Jonah to say Nineveh, but God was using Nineveh to save Jonah. Oh man! Oh man! Oh man! 
You see, you, you see, you see that's, that's the God we serve. And this is important. And I'm saying particularly, uh, uh, not only just for people in the church, for people outside, but for pastors also. Because we may think, it's easy for me to think that, you know what, uh, I'm in. I'm fine. Yeah. But, but, but God may have called me to save me. Yeah. You, know, you know, and that's important. That's important. That, that when you are in the church, look, we are saved to serve. Because it's, it is in the serving that we get saved also. So, so, so that's the reason why God did what he did. So God is a gracious God. That was an accusation jo- uh, 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 Jonah made. But, but Jonah did not know that in Exodus 34, that is God's character. It, that's, that's him. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, he wanted to save both Jonah yeah, man. and Nineveh. Yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you don't know what that has done to my mind. Hallelujah. It has sent things. <laughs> oh, goodness. Hallelujah. Yeah. So God had called Jonah to save Nineveh. And he wanted to save Nineveh in order to save Jonah. Amen. Oh, Amen. oh, I'll rest there. It's not my making a little down. Oh, yeah, man. Hallelujah. Yeah. Okay. So now, but, but my question still stands in Fundis. Was he a false prophet? I mean, he, he preached a, a, a prophecy that never happened. Hmm. And that never happened. What was supposed to happen after those days did not happen. Was that a false prophecy? It was a conditional prophecy. Good. Yes, it was a conditional prophecy. Please, plain, plain simple. I, I like that, please. Yeah, it was a conditional. It, yes. it's, it's true. It's true. Yes. So we, can can we then ap- apply that in our lives today? Yes. Apply what what kind? How do we know that these things that God has pro- these covenants that were claiming these promises that God has promised uh, are conditional? Yes. How do we yes. know? Because this is a very important part in our Christian walk. Because we would pray and things don't happen and we think I, God is a false God. He makes mm. promises and he does not keep them. But you're bringing a very eloquent teaching there. But in this case, it was a conditional prophecy. Yes. How then do we in our lives now know that this one is conditional? Yeah, look, look one of the problems that a Christianity, had, Christianity has is what we call prosperity gospel. Because prosperity gospel has no condition. You know, uh, all you must do, uh, uh, cash in your, your pension, <laughs> you know, bring this, bring that, and God will do this, you know. Uh, and that's very dangerous because, because, because uh, uh, what this teaches, not only prosperity gospel, even, even within the Adventist movement, I have had people in the pulpit uh, preaching prosperity gospel in, in a very subtle way. People must just understand that, uh, 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 and, you, uh, uh, and especially you hear the prosperity gospel subtly at 11 o'clock when it's time for tithes and offering. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so bring the tithe so that the windows can be open. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Yeah. But, but that cannot be true. That yeah. cannot be true. The very fact I'm here, it's, it's proven, it's, it's, it's evidence that my windows, the windows of heaven are, are open. Now, 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 if the blessing are based on me giving the ten percent so that the windows can be open, what are you telling someone who's unemployed? Because remember, in every utterance, there's an implication. So, so we've got to be, we, we, we've got to be to be careful. Oh, and, and now, when it comes to we 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 we, we recite the promises, you know, uh, your Jeremiah twenty nine, yeah. you know, uh, and then we trip. On that Jeremiah 29, when bad things happen to us. Now, now then I ask you, what happened to Jeremiah 29? You understand? And so sometimes we, 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 we also don't understand the context. Because if, even that Jeremiah 29, a lot of times is quoted out of context. All right? So, so people must understand that uh, God's promises come with conditions. So if God says, I'm going to do this, you must then ask yourself a question. What's the condition here? Ask yourself that question. You know, no, my, my philosophy of life, part of my philosophy of life is when you want to know more and to understand better yourself first and all other things, do a drill down approach. 
drill down means, means, okay, this is what the promise is saying. And you ask, is there any condition here? What does this mean? Uh, is, 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 this, is this universal? You know, and so on. Or is this just specific? And so on. So, so ask you those questions before, because if you don't, you're going to trip and then accuse God for not being faithful. So, so we've got to be careful about uh, the promises that we make. Promises, we must, we, must, we must utter them. We must know them. We must believe them. But we must not be very blind about what the promises say. Okay. So, John 1.11, I have come that you might have life. and have it. More abundantly. Why are we dying? Why, why are we dying now? What, what happened? Why? You, see, <laughs> you, you, see, you see what I'm saying? So, so that is why I'm saying uh, it, it's, it's a matter of perspective, for understanding that um, there is a reason why God says what he says in every area of the Bible. You know, you know a, a person can always find a reason to do what he wants to do by reading a text. He can find a text and find a reason. I know someone, by the way, who, who committed suicide uh, and use the Bible for doing so. You know, I, I had to actually, I was asked to go and conduct a memorial service for that person. He died. You understand? So, so, so people will read anything and, uh, and just change it for them to fit their situation or to achieve their objective. Okay. All right. Now, after the, 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 the repentance of the people of Nineveh, yes. Jonah gets upset. Yeah. <laughs> Jonah throws his toys out of yeah, the cot. Exactly. He's angry with God. I knew you were a passionate God. Yeah. I knew, why did you send me then? If you knew that these people are going to repent, why did you say, why waste my time? Yes. What was going on there? It, it, really it, like? It, it's because. Jonah's God was in a box. Jonah's faith and understanding of who God is was structured. And you can't deal with God. You know that chorus that says, Jesus is so high. Yes, he can't he, get over him. He's so deep. He can't get under him. He's so wide. He can't get around him. That's God. <laughs> That's God we save. So, so in, in, in other words... You, you, you cannot say, because in this particular situation, this is how God came through. Therefore, a similar situation, God will come through similarly. It, 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 does, it doesn't work like that. Now, that is why I was saying at the beginning, uh, the book of Jonah is about, amongst other things, mission. So when people... You know, we sit in the church and we talk about mission. Every church should be saying, what's our mission where we are? And start working on that. So sometimes we sit in the church and, uh, and we talk about evangelizing a particular place and someone in the back of his mind says, uh, you know what? There's no way those people can, can embrace this message. There's just no way. There's just no way. You know, that's a Jonah mentality, Jonah mindset. Because that's exactly how Jonah felt. And therefore, when, when at last he found himself there in Nineveh, he realized that, you know what, you can't work, run, out, run away from this God. And then people are, are changed. So in other words, again, God is proving him wrong. Okay. Uh, our time is up in fullness. I'd like you to give us now what you'd like us to walk away from the story of Jonah with. What, what, what would you like us to yes. carry home now as we part ways in the story of Jonah? All of us are created for a purpose. All of us, regardless of who you are and where you are, we are created with a purpose. And therefore, it is your primary duty to find out what is it that God wants to accomplish through me. What is it that I need to do for God's purpose to be accomplished through my life? And that's, that's, that's key for me. And, and where, where we give God a vote of no confidence is when we try to be like somebody else. Because that says, God, you did not do a good job. God, you did not, God, you did not, you don't know why you created me. So now that I'm here, now you don't know why I am here. Let me just see what others are doing so that I can also pattern my life to that life. And therefore, so, so, 
so our primary duty is to find out. And what, what, what do you do to find out is to ask the question, why was I created and for what purpose? You know what? Many organizations out there, they, go, they grow big or international. And for one reason, and it, because their why is bigger and clearer, not only to the CEO, but even to the one who is sweeping the floors. Because when your why is clearer, it gives you much more oomph, purpose, drive to, be, to do what you become, to do what you want to do. Now, the reason why some companies don't last long, some organizations don't like, why some people don't, don't live fully, it's because they don't have a why. And, and, and when you, or, or sometimes because people are looking for a how, you know, you need a why, you don't need a how, a how because when your why is clearer, your how comes in handy. It's easy for you for that to come. And so, and so therefore, if, if, if all of us know and we are clear about our whys, we found purpose in living. We don't have to chase everything that everybody else is chasing. I have my, my, my corner, my space that I need to play in. You have your space, and somebody else has his own space, and that one has her own space. And when all of us are playing in the space for which we're created, therefore, we get everybody moving. We get everybody being able to achieve what he was able to achieve. Because if all of us are moving, then we begin to realize that, you know, uh, for, for, for me to continue to achieve, to, uh, to, to, to get to my destination, I also need Naya. I also need Sne. I also need so and 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 so. And when we do that together, and also you decide, you, you realize, good man, you need Jabu, you, you need uh, Sonia, you need uh, so and so and so and so and so and so. And everybody then succeeds. And I think that's the missing piece, not only in Adventism, but generally in black people. All right, we're going to leave it there. Uh, oh, that last part. I would like to bite on that last part, <laughs> but our time is up. Mbuzma <laughs> Pumuno, thank you very much for coming time to talk to us. Indeed, indeed, Mbuzma. Especially when it's 30 minutes, just 30 minutes. Yes. That's how we're going to end it. Thank you very much for tuning in from me, Nayelu Pondona, and the team. Have a wonderful day in God's speak.
Greetings and grace to you all in the name of our Lord and God our Father. And I believe that we are still blessed by the Lord and that we all are still well. And for our text this day, we are going to look at the book of Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. And the Bible reads as follows, as you read your Bible and I read mine. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And and, and let, let us say a prayer as we go into the word of the Lord. Father who art in heaven, we thank you for your blessing. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that we are able to engage with you through your word. Speak to us and draw us nearer to yourself through this word in Jesus Christ. Amen. A lot of scholars agree that the book of Ephesians was written by Paul and he, he writes it to the believers that are in a city that is called Ephesus. But one thing that they mention which is important for us to note is that they, are, they, they do suggest that it must be one of Paul's most profound and prominent work. And if you look at the letter itself, you do realize that it, 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 it speaks on topics that relate to how we are to relate to God or how God relates to us and how we are able to relate to him and to others in return. That is why I, I want to suggest to you that when you look at the book, you will notice that it is divided into two main sections. And if you look at these two clear segments, you notice that the first part of the letter is the, the chapter one, two, and three refers to what I would like to call the three first points. That is what God has done. And in chapter two, it speaks of who God has done it for and what position were those that God had done that for. And in the third chapter, then it speaks about the position, the results or the effects of what God has done. Then when you continue to chapter four, five and six, now it is the response of those that God has done for, they respond now to what God has done. So the, the, the chapters that follow four, five and six now are a response, uh, on, on what God has done in chapter one, two and three. But for our this course now, I want us to look at just the text we have read, that being of Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. And when you look 
at the text, as Paul starts to mention, or he starts with his points, he writes and he says, according as he hath chosen before the foundation of the world. Now, when I looked at this text, it brought some comfort in me because it gives the implication of permanency to say that which God has done, he did it even before I was born. But not only that, but that it lasts from one eternity to another. This gives value. It shows that that which God has done, there is normally a tendency among us as human beings to believe that if anything lasts longer, it is able, we are able to draw that this thing is good quality. And therefore, because God has done this, before the foundation of the world. The expression itself shows the limitlessness of what God has done for us. And if we are to consider that, then we are able to see the value of this thing that God has done for us. To, to, to think that even before we were born, God had already put in motion a plan that would make sure that we qualify for this thing. So now, it's, as you consider that with me, to look at the limitlessness of this gift, not only is it limited in the sense of history, but it is limitless in the present, and also it shows a sense of limitlessness for future also. Meaning that God's gift to us is not only in the past, God's gift to us is not only in the present, but God's gift to us and for us continues from one eternity to another. So that there is no one in the realms of time, in the sense that man uses time, who can say that they were outside of the time that God had set for his people that the gift can be accessed by them. And as you continue to consider the effect of the permanency of the gift, but it also shows that the value of the gift is in the fact that it was not a plan that was an afterthought. God did not do this as reciprocation to what would happen in the future, but God did this as part of his eternal plan, it shows the way, the, the, the arrangement, the way God arranges his things, that all of God's plan happen by design. They don't happen haphazardly. They don't happen out of nowhere or out of nothing. They happen because God had planned them from a long time ago. So I'm comforted by knowing that this God that we are speaking of, that Paul speaks of when he refers to the Ephesians, is not a God who does things with disorder, but is a God who does his things with order and with pre-arrangement. You know, the, 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 this brought a thought in my mind to say that when we had conceived a child together with my wife, we put in place systems that would make sure that the child is secure at the time they are born. I'll give you a very simple example that most parents may remember that even before your child is born, you start to buy certain things. I remember there is this plug that you put in the electric wall so that it closes up the socket even before the child is born. So that before the child is born, just in case this child walks up to an electric socket, then that socket is already protected so that that child may not be harmed by it. Let me just say this to someone, that God has put systems in place even before you were born. Sometimes when we go through the challenges of life, we begin to think that things are falling apart and God may not care, but I'd like to bring it to you that all things happen together for good for those who trust the Lord. That even when things look like they are breaking down God has put in place systems before you got to where you are God had already put in place systems that are going to protect you that are going to help you as you go along this way of life 
But when you look at chapter two, I mean chapter one again, and the, the very same text, Paul now says that he hath chosen. This is where I want us to spend a few minutes, and I want you to remember with me for those of us that are married that there was a time when you were looking at different ladies and you looked at that one and you chose her out of the rest. This is the thought that Paul brings when he speaks and he says, God hath chosen. He says that God picked out, God showed his preference by taking out this one out of the rest. Now, this gives a sense of importance, a sense of being special, but I want us to now look at the the, the, the common thing is that between a husband that is looking or a young man that is looking for a potential wife, he chooses amongst the rest. He makes a choice. He selects. So when Paul says he has chosen, he says that he made a choice and selected us. And this thought says that God selected us. But now the contradiction between a young man and God is that when I looked for a potential wife, I looked for one that had certain attributes I needed to find someone who was lovable the things that I considered to be lovable to myself I looked for a lady that had those attributes and when I saw her then I chose her out of the rest but I want you to realize that God does not choose us because we are lovable God does not choose us because we are better than others God does not choose us because we hold certain attributes that are attractive to him but God's choice of us is because he himself is love so God chooses us out of his grace even when we are undeserving even when we are unworthy even if it is not our right to be chosen God chooses us anyway he does not wait for us to be lovable he does not wait for us to to be impressive to him he does not wait for us to be attractive before he chooses us because the Bible is very clear it says that even before the foundation of the world, before the world was conceived, God had already made his decision about you. You are chosen of God. And the idea of being chosen with out bringing anything says this that when you consider that God has done that for you you are able to look at others as God looked at you to say in as much as I was undeserving I cannot therefore monopolize this position that I am in with all the appreciation that I have for it I cannot be arrogant I cannot be proud I cannot look at others different because the Bible is very clear for it says in the book of of Romans all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God even in that sinful state God still chose me it does speak and he says while you were yet sinners God chose you so he did not wait for us when even when we preach our gospel we don't preach a gospel that says to others that stop smoking and come to church we don't preach a gospel that stop being an adulterer and come to church. We don't say stop being a liar and come to church. We don't say to people dress this way first, be vegetarian first and come to church. But we preach a gospel that says in the same way that God has chosen us before before we were even right, before we were deserving, then we preach a gospel to others that says come as you are. We call them as well and say, in your state, you are most welcome in the family of God. For in as much as I was chosen when I was undeserving, I do call you to join me. Because I am not there because I am deserving. I am not there because I am better. I am not there because I am worthy. I am there because he is better. I am there because he is worthy. I am there because he is deserving, but I am not deserving or worthy. So this now draws a, a certain distinction so that we are able to take it out of our minds and the arrogance is broken into pieces of making us think that we are part of this choosing because we offered something to God, but no, we did not offer anything to God. And the question might be then, 
That what is it that God used to choose us? What did God look at when he chose us? And the text is very clear when you, when you read it. And in verse 5, it, it, it says that we were chosen through Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus. Now this I would like to call the method that God used to choose us. Let us go back to the analogy that I gave you earlier. That when a young man goes out to woo, when a young man goes out to court a lady, and after they had realized that this woman is good enough for me to marry, then they would send out an entourage that goes to the lady's home, then they call or they ask for her arm or have a hand in marriage but you look at it now when when they go there the, the family that is now the family of the young lady they would now present certain benefits certain attributes to say that no we took this child to school they would say no she was brought up well she has got a degree she is working and all of these other attributes but now when god chooses he does not choose based on that if jesus be our uncle that goes to ask for our hand in marriage then when he comes back to the father and the father asks why must i choose her and then jesus can clearly say because of what i have done because of the merits of Jesus Christ, we hold no merits for us to be worthy of this choosing, this selection, this choice that God makes. We hold no merits except that Jesus becomes the one that goes back to the Father and says, Father, I have brought you a wife. And when God asks, what is it about this wife that makes her to be deserving of my choice? And Jesus stands there, I can imagine, and he says, because of my merits. So Paul says we are chosen in Christ Jesus. So Jesus becomes the merits that make the father to look at us and make us his choice so when when god has has made his decision about us and not only does he choose us because of jesus christ so jesus is the one that is rightly chosen but now god through jesus christ includes us in that choice so because of jesus christ in him there are merits in him there is worthiness in him there are blessings and benefits as to why god has chosen so anyone that comes in and from and through jesus christ and is presented to the father by jesus christ then becomes god's choice that is the method the the the, the one who is deserving of being chosen is one who comes through the merits of Jesus Christ, not in their own merits. Let, let this be the gospel that we preach, dear friends, that we are chosen because of the merits that belong to Jesus Christ. He is the uncle that comes to negotiate for our hand in marriage. And when he goes back to the father, he says, Father, they are unworthy. Father, they are undeserving. Father, they have no right to belong to this family. But because of what I have done, because of my merits, then choose them. But I'm interested as we come to the close of this discourse, that this choosing that God bestows on us is not a passive one, but God chooses in order to extend his favor over those that he chooses. I want someone to hear this. Much as a husband would marry a woman and they would declare and vow that they are going to love them only. They would declare and vow that they are going to take care of them. They would declare and vow that they are going to protect them. They would declare and vow that they are going to, to, to offer gifts. To, now, in the same way that a husband makes a vow and they are choosing becomes an exercise of saying that I am choosing you so that when you stay with me, there are certain benefits that you are going to get from this. God does the same. His choosing is a choosing of favor. There are certain favors that we get when we accept this choice that God has made on us. God does not choose us to leave us in a house that has no provision. God chooses us and he gives us provision. God chooses us and he gives us shelter god chooses us and he gives us food god chooses us his choice over us is a choice that comes with favor so when you accept 
The choosing that God makes, it's a choosing that comes with many other benefits that come from the Father that belong to the Son. But because we are now fellow heirs with Jesus, now we take these benefits, these favors that belong to the Son are now extended to us because of the Son. And, 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 and but the, the, of, of all of these gifts, Paul now, when he ends up, he, he speaks in, in chapter, and he says that when he has chosen us, he chooses us so that we should be holy and righteous before him. And when you understand this thought, it says that when he has chosen us, now he chooses us so that we are able to be in his company. But no man has seen God before, for there is enmity between man and God, between good and evil. But when God has chosen us, he chooses us to make us holy in Jesus Christ. And when we have been made holy in Jesus Christ, then we are able to get the benefit. The most important one is that God now makes us righteous. He makes us holy. He makes it possible for us to sit in his company. So that when we are in his company, then we are able to benefit from who God is. Let me speak to someone today as we sum up this discourse and say that because God has chosen us for the sick, because God is healing, the sick get healed. Let me speak to someone who, whose family may, or in their life, they may be going through turmoil and stress and strife. And let me say, God has chosen you and brought you to himself as a man brings a wife to their father's house. And because of that, if you are going through the different challenges of life, the Bible says that he is the prince of peace. He is peace that surpasses all understanding. Whatever it is, that we may have a challenge with when we come to God after he has chosen us through Jesus Christ, then we are able to get this favor that God has bestowed upon us. The favor of being righteous, of being holy in Jesus Christ, not of our own merits, not because we deserve it, not because we are worthy, not because we are right with God, but God makes us right through Jesus Christ and then he chooses us. I'm praying with someone that says, God, I accept your choice of me. This is not an, a, a, a normal a normal choice that God made. God, God has made a decision. And when you continue to read, it says he has adopted us into his family. So Jesus qualifies for all of the legal demands that make us to no longer be servants, but to be sons and daughters in the father's house. So all of the legal demands are met in Jesus Christ. And because of that, we are no longer sons, we are no longer slaves, we are no longer servants, but we are now sons and daughters. And I know that for many of us who may not have experienced it, but we can speak and declare that for those that are born in certain families, there are certain benefits that they get that others don't get from other families. And I want to say all of us are now chosen through Jesus Christ. And we are no longer servants or slaves, but we are now sons and daughters of God. I want that to sink in, that we are now sons and daughters of God. I, 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 I saw recently with, 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 with the, with, with the placing of the new king in the Zulu nation and people on social media are making comments of how they would have wished that they would be part of this family as they look at all of the benefits that come with being a son, a child, or even a spouse of a king. And, and, and people have, they envisage, they wish to be part of the, and I say to you, you can be part of a greater family. You can be adopted into the family of God. And enjoy all of the favors, all of the blessings that come with being part of the family. And if that be your wish, that you also may respond. Because God has already done it. Let me, let me just say this. God has already chosen it. God chosen you. You are already before when you were being formed in your mother's womb. God had already chosen. Yes, I'm speaking to you as an individual. That God had already made his decision about you. And if that be the case, 
And it means that we need to now align our decision with God's decision. So lest we get lost and we think that it is God, God has chosen being lost on us. But no, no, we just need to align our mind with the mind of Christ. Our decision, our plans, we need our motives must be aligned with the motives of God. And if that be your wish, and you pray that you may align your, 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 your thought, you may align your wish with what God has already done for you. And let, let's pray together. You are praying with me now, and the prayer is as follows. We are going to pray that because God has already done it, he has already chosen us, that we may align our choices with his choice. That is the prayer we are praying. If that be your wish, let us close our eyes and pray together. Father who art in heaven, we thank you for your son Jesus Christ because it is in him that we are chosen, that we are no longer slaves, but we are now sons and daughters of God. Oh, what a blessing it is to be part of this family where God becomes the father that takes care of all of his children, but more than anything else, that God is a father that offers salvation, that these gifts, this faith, these favors that are given are not only in the past, not only in the present but the intention of this choosing is permanent in nature and help us that we may align our decision with your decision to choose us that we may identify it that we may know it and that we may be able to accept your choice for our lives and align our thoughts align our ideas align our motives align our feelings that they may be aligned to what you have chosen for us already and we pray for this believing that you shall do because of your grace in Jesus name we pray amen
Ah, tu...